Today we're starting a brand new sermon series called Follow. You came on a great, great Sunday. If I were to um, take a moment and kind of check out your Instagram account um, and look at the people you're following, who would I find? I know if you check out my Instagram account, you'll see some family, you'll see some friends, you'll see some sports news Instagram accounts, Twitter accounts, right, sports news. You'll also see some pastor friends, some churches, and you'll also see that I follow some of my favorite sports teams, like, of course, the New York Yankees, the only team in New okay, New York Yankees, and New York Rangers, my Giants, and how about them Knicks, everybody? First playoff win on the road since 1999, was it? Come on, Nick. Nick fans in the house? Nick fans in the house? So, 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 so we follow people, and, and what's interesting, social media has redefined the word follow. They have redefined the word friend. So if I were to check out your Instagram or your Twitter, if you still use that, or, or I would see that you follow a lot of people. And if I check out your Facebook account and see your friends, you have a boatload of friends. So, so follow used to mean follow, like you actually follow someone. Now follow means that I follow them on social media. I never met them. Most of the people, I don't know them. I don't have a relationship with them, but I know all about them because I follow them. And then the word friend has now changed. Social media has redefined the word friend. Friend used to mean you had a friend that you actually knew and spoke to and hung out, went to the movies. Now friend is simply you are connected on Facebook. People come up to me and say, oh, I'm your friend on Facebook. I'm your friend. Great. Nice to meet you, friend. So the word follow and the word friend and ultimately what we really should be calling it is fans. That we're, we're, we're not really following people. We're not really friends with people. We're fans of people. We're fans of celebrities. Like I follow The Rock. I'm a fan of The Rock, right? People sometimes think I kind of look a little bit like The Rock. You know what I mean? I've tried that before. Stop in public. They give me a double take. It happens. It happens. I follow The Rock. I follow Sylvester Stallone. He's my man. I follow Aaron Judge. So this word follow and this word friend, what we're really saying is you're not following the person. You're not friends with the person. You're just a fan of the person. And I think that when we think about our faith, and we think about our relationship with Jesus, this I know, that God is looking for followers. God is not interested in fans. He's looking for followers. And the thing about the word follow is that in our minds, we think that following Jesus is similar to following the rock or our favorite celebrity. But how many know that following Jesus is not like following the rock? You can't follow Jesus the way you follow your favorite celebrity. And here's the point. Some of us in this room today have an Instagram relationship with Jesus. In which you like some of his posts a.k.a. Bible verses. Oh, that's a good one. Like. You read some of his memes. Right? You know a lot about him. You kind of listen to his music. A.k.a. worship songs. Christian songs. So we listen to his music. We, we, we read his posts and we follow his memes. And, and just because you follow Jesus, or I should say, just because you say you follow Jesus doesn't mean you really follow Jesus the way Jesus meant 
the way Jesus desires, the way Jesus wants you to. We can't follow Jesus the way we follow our celebrities. And you say, what's the difference? Jesus wants you to follow him, not with simply likes or posts. He wants you to be fully surrendered to him. He wants you to know him. He wants you to have a relationship with him. He wants you to have a personal relationship in which you don't just know about him, but you know him. And he knows you. And you know his voice. And he knows yours. And when he speaks, you listen. And you speak to him. Following Jesus is more than following your favorite celebrity on social media. Following Jesus means that Jesus is your everything. And to truly follow Jesus means that Jesus is everything. And if Jesus is not everything, then he is nothing. I wish y'all were with me today because y'all not ready for this word. Y'all not ready for this word. Because some of you, I feel the tension in the room because some of you have issue with that statement. Because to some of you, Jesus is something, but he's not everything. And the way Jesus calls it out, the, the way Jesus describes it in Scripture, is that you cannot be a halfway disciple of Jesus. You can't. You can't be a halfway follower of Christ. You can't be hot or cold, and, 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 and you can't be lukewarm. You've got to be a sold-out follower of Jesus in which Jesus is your everything. He's got to be our everything. Because when Jesus, we celebrated Easter last year, and Jesus didn't halfway save us. Jesus gave us everything. He gave us his son. He died on a cross for our sins. And what Jesus wants in return is everything from us. Unfortunately, a lot of us are not true followers of Christ. We're fans. What's a fan? A fan is an, an, an enthusiastic admirer. And some of you are secret admirers of Jesus. You're enthusiastic admirers. You know, fans, right? Fans, I love, I'm a fan. I'm a sports fan. I, I was tempted to wear my sports fan gear this morning. Um, man, I wear the gear if you walk in the parking lot, you'll know what car I drive <laughs> based on how, it's, how it is and the logo is on it. Um, if you check out my accounts, you, you know I'm a big fan. But just because I'm a fan doesn't mean I have a relationship with the team. And I think the truth is, can I speak truth to some of y'all today? Because this is going to help you. I think some of you are really fans of Jesus and God is not interested in fans. I mean, we do the fan thing. We kind of show up and we cheer. Yay! Right? We might wear the religious clothing or the religious cross. We might say we're, we're followers because maybe we attend church or we watch church online or, 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 or we're somewhat religious in our faith. And I'm just here to tell you that God is not interested in fans. He's looking for followers. He's looking for people who follow him with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. He's looking for people who are sold out for him. He's looking for people. He's looking for people that say that he is their everything, not something. Jesus can't be your something. Jesus has to be your everything. And if he's not your everything, church, he's nothing. So let's ask ourselves this question. When it comes to Jesus, are you a fan? Are you a friend? Or are you a true follower? And if you're not there in the journey, I'm not here to shame your game or shame you. 
or say, you know what, you're a terrible person because I wasn't always a follower of Jesus. I had to go through this process of taking steps in my faith in which I became a follower of Jesus. But today, God is really wanting to challenge your relationship. He wants you to challenge, he's challenging your relationship with him because for some of you, it's time to take that next step in your journey in which you become not a fan, but not a friend, but a follower of Jesus. And Jesus defines to us what a follower is. He kind of explains to us what it means to follow him. He's very clear. Jesus is not ambiguous. He's very clear in, in his definition of what it means to follow him. Y'all with me? Y'all want to go deeper? If y'all not ready, that's okay. Just kind of, is this going to be, we're going to go deep now. Y'all ready? All right, here we go. Jesus said this, if any of you wants to be my follower, it's pretty clear, right? You must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Stop right there. Woo! That's like enough. That's all I can handle today because the word cross is in there. Are you kidding me? What, what is Jesus saying here? Another translation, New International says, if anyone comes after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. We all know Jesus hung on a cross for our sins. But now Jesus flips the script and says, if you want to follow me, you have a cross you need to carry. In other words, you need to crucify your desires. You need to crucify your flesh. You need to crucify your sinful nature. You need to crucify your selfish ambitions. You got to crucify your dreams, your plans, your purposes, your goals. Every day, is, it, it's, it's about following Jesus every day. It's a daily. This is daily. This is not weekly. It's not monthly. It's not annually. Following Jesus is daily. In which every day, you give up your own way of thinking, your own way of living, your own plans, your own desires, and say, God, not what I want, but what you want for your life. I know that we encourage people to raise their hands for salvation and get baptized, but the truth of the matter is this. If you have not fully surrendered to Jesus, his will, his plan, his purpose for your life, if you have not said, God, not my way, but yours, you're not following. You're an enthusiastic admirer. But that's okay because God loves you so much. Today, oh, he's going in. He's going in on us today. Now, now, are you ready for the next verse or do we need like a pause? Do we need like a little pause? What do they call it when you need like a break? What do they do it in school when you? Do we need a recess? Like just a quick recess to recover? A little quick timeout to breathe. Let's do the timeout. All right. Man. All right. You all ready to keep going? All right. So Jesus says, if you follow me, give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Here we go. Verse 24. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake... You will save it. If you really want life, you give up your life. But if you hold on to your life, you will lose it. He's talking spiritual here. He's talking spiritually speaking. If you fully surrender, you'll find it. If you don't, you'll lose it. Last verse, 25. And what would it benefit you if you what? Let's read it together. If you gain the whole world, what are yourself lost or destroyed? What's the profit of man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? What's the profit of man if he gains everything this world has to offer but yet loses his own soul? Everything we're trying to achieve, everything we're trying to access, everything we're trying to possess, 
What is it profit if we spend our life trying to achieve and be outwardly successful yet lose our own soul in the process? So today, I'm going to explain this in a moment. We're going to have a DTR. Hold that slide for a second. We're going to have a DTR. What's a DTR? When my wife and I were, were dating after a few weeks, I think we had to come to the point that we had to have a DTR. Like, what are we? Are we seeing each other? Do they still see each other now? That's not, that's old school, right? See each other, right? When I grew up, we're seeing each other. That doesn't mean we're dating. It just means we're like special friends and we see each other. Or are we like boyfriend or girlfriend? Or are we just special friends? Or are we just hanging? We came to a point where we had to have a DTR. What's a DTR? A DTR is, here's up on the screen, we had to define the relationship. Are we hanging out? Are we seeing each other? Are we special friends? Are we dating? Or are we boyfriend and girlfriend? Man, my wife was after me for weeks. I'm just telling you. She kept saying. She had to step out a minute, and that's what she gets. Now I'm talking. Now I'm talking. I'm talking. She's like, what are we? Because I love you. I can't live without you. I need you. I need you. Now, security or host team, I know you're running to go find her right now. I know it because that's happened in the past. Stop in your tracks. But Jesus wants to have a DTR with you today. He, he, he wants to know what this relationship is. Are, are you like seeing each other? Are you seeing God? Are you dating him? Are you special friends? Or are you ready for marriage? Marriage. Marriage. Because we are called the bride of Christ, the church. This is a marriage. This is not, this is not like hooking up and dating or seeing. This is, this is we're getting married. We're married. I want to know what kind of relationship you have with God right now. And it's okay wherever you're at on the spectrum. You can be a fan. You can be a secret admirer, enthusiastic admirer, a friend. Well, he's my, he's, Jesus is my homie. I've heard that before. And, 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 and he, he could be anything. But today, he just wants you to define it. And, and he wants you to see it for what it really is. And he wants you to take a next step in your journey with him. Are we cool with that? So, so where are we with that? In your own way, answer that question. And let me help you answer that question of, you know, are we a fan, friend, or follower? Let me, let me just ask you some questions to help you clarify the question. Am I a fan or am I a follower? The first question is, why are you here today? Why are you here? Why are you in the house? Why are you in the building? Why did you come to church? And we have all different reasons why. Why are we attending online? There's a lot of different reasons why. And if we can kind of unpack those reasons, maybe it makes us feel good. Maybe it's because it's, we just know it's the right thing to do. Maybe we were raised in church. We don't know what else to do on Sunday morning. Does, is there anybody like that? Like Sunday morning, it's just automatic. You're just like, go to church. I go to church. I mean, it's just in you. Like for me, that's the way I was. I was born in a pew. Even when I try to live my own life, I woke up on Sunday morning and said, it's time for church. It's time for church. It's just ingrained in me. Or, or maybe you're here because you want to please your spouse. Or, or maybe you're here because you know you need to do something good with your life. Or maybe it's good for your family. Or, or maybe you're here because the idea of faith makes you feel good. Or maybe you're here because you're American, faith, family, freedom, you know. It's what we do. We're Americans. And, and, and there's a lot of reasons why we might be here. Or maybe you're just after something from God. Maybe you're asking Jesus to do something for you. Because a lot of times our relationship is based on what God can do for me. And we see this in John chapter 6. Sometime later, Jesus, in, in John 6, 
um, Jesus crossed to, to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And verse 2 tells us, and a great crowd of people, what did they do? They followed him for what reason? They saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. What was their reason for following Jesus? They were following Jesus because of what Jesus could do for them. They were following Jesus because of what he could do, not because of who he was. And then Jesus doesn't dismiss the crowds. He, he kind of goes in and he performs signs and wonders and miracles. And I believe in this passage, forgive me, I don't have my notes open, but I believe in this passage, Jesus also feeds the 5,000 and he's feeding them bread and he's feeding them fish and he's like meeting all of their physical needs. And, and, and the disciples then um, recognize that all these people came not because of who Jesus was, they came because of what Jesus did and could do for them. So Jesus, understanding this, asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And, and the disciples said, well, they, some of them think you're a prophet or a, a man or whatever it was. And then Jesus said, who do you think that I am? And the disciples said, you're God, the Messiah, the Son of God. God was interested not in the crowds. He was interested in people becoming followers to followers. And then he kind of explains to this crowd who came to him for the wrong reasons. He explains what it really means to follow Jesus. Y'all ready for this verse? Oh my goodness. You thought the other ones were rough. So now he says, go down to verse 53. Jesus says to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's a big difference than following Jesus like we follow our favorite Instagram celebrity, right? He's like, you're not a real follower unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's talking to people that were focused on feeding their physical needs. He's like, no, I'm not talking about my literal flesh and blood. Eat the flesh and drink my blood simply means if you believe and receive. And then Jesus becomes a part of you and flows through you. He's a part of everything you do. He's talking about oneness with God. He's talking about intimate relationship. He's talking about becoming one with God. He's talking about th that deep-rooted relationship in which you believe and receive. And now Jesus is in you. And he's a part of you. And he flows through, the, through your veins. But after he explains this to the crowd, look what happens on John 6. It's just really weird. <laughs> like John 6, 6, 6. How many want to know what John 6, 6, 6 says? Here we go. From this time, many disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Why? It cost them too much. Many people today are walking away from God and the church and Christianity and Jesus because it costs them too much. It's too much work, too much effort, too much to give, too much to do, too much to sacrifice, too much to surrender. I struggle with that years and years ago. It was a huge struggle of mine. I wanted to do what I wanted to do in my life. If you've heard my story, if you've been to attending our church for any length of time, I, I wanted to get into law enforcement, criminal justice. I wanted to be in state police. I went to college for it. I, I, I used to imagine pulling people over. It's just in my head. It's just who I was. I used to drive my car like I thought I was in a cop car. I was 20 years old, 21. Um, it was just like, like I wanted to do it. And I remember when the Lord said, is it your will or mine? Your plans or mine? I have a plan for your life. I have a purpose for your life. 
to have a destiny for your life. That's why when, when Jesus told us to pray, he said what? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. It's not our will. It's not our plan. It's not our purpose. It's what God wants for our life. That means it'll cost us. Now, salvation is free, but following Jesus will cost you everything. And if Jesus is not your everything, then he's nothing. It's true. I can remember having to surrender my dreams, my goals, my ambitions, my desires for what I thought I was being crucified. I felt like I was being crucified. I felt like God was stripping me from what I wanted. I was miserable. I was unhappy. I said, God, if you want it, you're such a mean God. You're such a mean God. You've taken everything from me. God wasn't a mean God. He was saving me from my own self. For my own ambitions, my own dreams, my own desire. His plan was better. His dreams are better. His purposes are better. They're always better. They're always better. They're always better. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in the future. God's way is always a better way. God's plan is always a better plan. God's purpose is always a better purpose. Notice, let's go back to verse 23. He says, if anyone follows me, wants to be my father, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow. Why are you here? Second question is, are you all in? When I was a little boy in, in the city, I grew up in the city in, in an apartment building, and I started a, a bicycle repair business. I was like nine or ten. I love bicycles, BMX. And I, I, I wanted to fix bikes, kids in the building. And... Um, I got my first client, my first customer, brought his bike to my house and just fixing and doing the chain and cleaning it out. And, and, and there was a moment that I had to have a DTR, like, am I going to have to hire employees? <laughs> Is this going to be my calling, my career? Right? You got to think, you got to say, okay, I'm starting this business. Is this going to be what I'm going to do the rest of my life? Do I have to hire people? Do I have to get insurance? Do I have to, like... My mom could be my secretary. What am I going to do here? And, you know, after two weeks and only one customer, I realized that <laughs> I had to close Joe Fixits because it really wasn't working. And I wonder how many today just need to, I wonder how many today you're looking at your life, and it's like things aren't working. I, I got to make a change. I have to. I can't do this the rest of my life. I need God in my life. Eventually, you have to come to a point that you make that decision and say, am I going to be all in with God? And the reason why some of you are struggling, struggling in your faith, struggling in your walk with God, struggling financially, struggling, 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 is because you're not, half, you're not all in. You're halfway in. I grew up in a, in, in a, in a religious home and in, in a church that was pretty religious. And they said, you, it, I always used to hear, you can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church, right? And, I get, and, and, and now I get that, but it's so true, isn't it? You can't just have one foot in the world and one foot with God and then expect everything to be blessed and work out well. In other words, let's talk a little about customized Christianity. I'm almost done. I'm going to let up the heat a little bit. Customized Christianity says, I'll follow Jesus, but, 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 but only in the areas that are comfortable and convenient for me. Like if it costs me my relationship with my girlfriend, if it costs me, if, if it's going to cost me not sleeping, if it's going to cost me my money, if it's going to cost me my time, if it's going to cost me something, then, then I don't know if that's, if that's going to work out for me. And Jesus said, this is what it means to follow me. If you love me, you'll follow me. You'll keep my commands. You'll do what I ask you to do because my way is always the better way. My plans are always the better plan. You see, fans say, I'll follow on my own terms. But followers say, I'll follow on God's terms. It's God's terms, not mine. 
I, I, you can't, it's not like let's make a deal. God says, okay, well, let's make a deal. I'll let you do this. I'll let you live this way. I'll let you do this way. But, you know, you can, no, it's, it's not let's make a deal with God. It's, it's either you're all in or you're all out. If he's not everything, then he's nothing. Let's DTR today. Let's all have a DTR. You might have to have that this week and say, God, where are we with this? And if you're not where you need to be, that's fine. It's okay. God says, take the next step. Take the next step. Because I want to do something incredible in your life. I want to do something incredible through your life. Young people, don't wait till you're older. Children, don't wait till you're older. Follow Jesus now. Avoid the mistakes we all made. Can, can, how many made mistakes growing up, right? We all made mistakes. How many would tell the children, avoid them. Follow Jesus. Children, follow him. And last, the, the third point, not the last, the third point says, have you made it your own? Children, you can't live on your mom's faith, your dad's faith. You can't live on grandma's faith or grandpa's faith. I used to hear this growing up. God don't have no grandkids. In other words, you can't live off your parents' faith. You got to have your own. Is this your own? Like, is this yours? Is this all about your relationship with God? So here's the invitation. Jesus said, I love this. If anyone wants to be my follower, let him come after me. Real quick. Who's invited? Anyone is welcome. Anyone is welcome. Now, we're going to wrap this up really quick. Anyone's welcome. Now, this is really powerful because Jesus was a rabbi. Now, rabbis had what's called Talmuds. Talmuds were students. And in order to become a student of a particular rabbi, there was a whole application process that was involved. You had to get interviewed. You had to fill out applications. They had to know how much knowledge of, of the law you had. It was, it was an arduous process because the rabbi, his credibility and his respect in the community was dependent upon his students. Were they smart? Were they wise? Were they sharp? Were they, if you follow what I'm saying. So when Jesus says, if anyone, anyone meant everyone. In other words, you didn't have to have a spiritual resume to follow Jesus. You don't have to have an application. You don't, you don't need to be smart. You don't need to know the Bible. You don't need to have it all together. It, it, Jesus invites everyone and anyone to follow him as his disciple. If you have a sexual past, he invites you. If you have a sinful past, he invites you. If you've made bad, bad mistakes, he's, you're invited. If you had an abortion... You're invited. If you've committed a crime, you're invited. It, it, it doesn't matter if you were once a dancer or a stripper or whatever you've done with your life. It, 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 God says anyone and everyone is invited to be a Talmud, a follower, a disciple of Jesus, a disciple of the greatest rabbi that ever lived, right? That's what it means. It's everyone, and it means everyone, but follow me here. Just, just hang in there with me as his last point. It's everyone, but it's everything. It's everything. It's everything. It's our, it's our heart. It's our mind. It's our soul. It's our strength. It's our will. It's our dreams. It's our desires. If anyone wants to follow him, they must take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up the cross. And follow me, for whoever wants to gain his life must lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will gain it. As we close, what are you holding on to? What are you holding on to? What are you holding back? What are you grasping? Are your fists clenched or are they open? What are you afraid of? You know, as a young person, I was afraid of not having fun. I was afraid of not being able to have fun in life. I, I just loved to party. I loved to go out. I loved to go to clubs. I used to like the girls. I used to like the cars, fast cars. I used to like all those things. And I thought if I followed Jesus, man, life would be boring. <laughs> I was so mistaken. I didn't find life until I found the bread of life. I didn't know what life was until I had an encounter with the life, the resurrection and the life. 
And I think some of you are right at the cusp of, 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 of your faith, and, and you're right there, and Jesus is saying, what are we? Are, are we still dating, or are you ready to get married? You ready to get married? Because I'm ready. I'm ready to have this commitment with you. I've, I've committed. I have you. Is Jesus your everything? Or is he something? I know this is a hard message for some of you, and that's okay. It's not meant to kind of be heavy on you. Take it home. Process it. Pray about it. Jesus wants to be your everything. He wants to be your everything. When you find Jesus, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm praying, I'm, I'm speaking, and I, I, I kind of sound like I'm emotional because I don't know if you hear my soul, my soul's crying out through my, my words because Jesus is my everything. And, and, and I just, I'm doing my best to use my words to articulate to you the joy of knowing Jesus journey. He says, take that next step. If you're a fan, well, let's just say, if you're not even a fan, he says, hey, just start being a fan. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not his friend, take a step, be a friend. But if you're a friend, he says, now it's time to become a follower. To say, I release everything to you, Jesus. What are you holding on to? If you hold on to what you have, that's all you'll ever have. But if you just surrender, as we close, could we stand together? I just feel like posture is so important. Can you just lift your hands? If you feel comfortable, no worries. It's not about what you do or don't, but just like when the cops come and say, you know, pull over, stick them up. You know, you're like, yes, I surrender. Can we do that with God? And just say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender all to you, Jesus. I surrender. Ask him, Lord, where are areas of my heart that I need to surrender? What are areas of my life that I need to surrender? I give it all to you. I give it all to you. Everything. Why don't you tell him, Jesus, you're my everything. It's up to you. Jesus, you're my everything. How does that happen? Just say, Lord, I commit my heart to you. I surrender my life to you. I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a brand new start. You're my everything. You can put your hand down. Let's pray this prayer together. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be my everything. I surrender my life, my future, my plans, my dreams, my goals to you. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my life, in my family, in my home. My hands are up. I surrender in Jesus' name. And everybody together said amen and amen.